Hola. 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 Warm greetings to everyone who's watching us live from various parts of the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ruben Lobo and on behalf of team dentistchannel.online, I warmly invite you to the last session. In fact, the best session of the sixth day of the biggest virtual implantology event of 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, we have with us a very special speaker amongst us. Dr. Mauro is known as the father of short implants all over the world. When you talk short implants, there is no one who can challenge Dr. Mauro and the kind of cases that he has been doing since his decades of experience. A very down-to-earth personality, a person who's multi-talented and a person who knows many languages. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us a very, very, very special speaker. I can say the person who can not be challenged by anyone when it comes to short implants. A short introduction about a speaker, Dr. Mauro Marincola. Dr. Mauro graduated from the La Sapienza University in Rome in the year 1988 and received his Italian and German doctorate degree in dentistry and dental prosthetics in the year 1990. In 1998, he received his master's degree in stomatology with a focus in implant dentistry from the Center of Research and Postgraduate Studies at the Medical Academy of Rome. And in the year 2003, he received his title as a specialist in implantology from the Order of Physicians and Dentists from Germany. Currently, Dr. Mauro Marincola serves as the clinical director of the International Center of Oral Implantology and as a professor at the dental school at the University of Cartagena in Colombia where he has been clinically active and has taught since the year 1997. Dr. Mauro Marincola has also served as a visiting professor at several dental schools, such as the Beijing University, at the Nanjing University, at the University of Leuven, at the University of Rome and Verona, and the Midwestern University, Arizona. Since 1998, he has been the head of the scientific research coordinator for Bicon, Boston, Massachusetts, where he is the co-developer of the innovative surgical and restorative techniques of the Bicon implant system, along with Dr. Vincent Morgan. Dr. Marincola is an author and the co-author of numerous scientific articles in international dental journals. He lectures extensively in Europe, Asia, USA, and Latin and South America on dental implant related topics. He speaks fluent Italian, German, English, and Spanish. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting to you, Dr. Mauro Leib. Hello. Good afternoon to everyone and everybody. Uh, I suppose uh, most of you are in, uh, in, uh, in the India area and uh, enjoying that uh, beautiful uh, first uh, World Congress, uh, virtual World Congress, which was very well organized. And thanks for the invitation, Rubin. Thank you for uh, for your uh, nice introduction. And uh, the important thing is uh, about about uh, the short implants. Uh, so surely you can uh, you can handle short implants very well if you know how to how to use them. Uh, in the last thirty years, so there were an evolution of uh, of short implants, which was uh, generally the thing of uh, uh, thinking that short implants were an optional implant for, uh, for uh, implant treatment. But uh, with the time, uh, we realized that uh, mostly uh, with the, our, our kind of implants, which are, which are the short implants from Bicon, which I'm using uh, generally for almost 30 years, I have to say it, uh, the, the outcomes uh, were completely different to what uh, the literature initially said. Now, in the last seven, eight years, it sounds much better. Uh, short implants are accepted uh, general-wise, and uh, short implants are used also in uh, single crown restorations. Uh, but uh, there is always uh, uh, something uh, which, is, which is the extreme. And, uh, what we do and we are doing in the last 10 years is mostly working with very extreme cases in, in all these uh, <coughs> universities uh, that uh, Ruben uh, was mentioning. And uh, we were uh, working very hard on 
what it's not possible to do in implant dentistry. And so I will show you uh, uh, <coughs> with, an, with a clinical case what, uh, what uh, can happen if we have a completely different, different idea of uh, short implants and uh, if we have completely different uh, uh, designs of implants which are able, even if they are very small and tiny, to support even fixed prosthetics. So this patient, and when she came to us, she was uh, 82 years old and had an extreme atrophic uh, mandible, mandibular. And uh, she was uh, treated several times. 12 surgeries were done on her. And in all 12 surgeries, they used guided surgery which is fine, it's perfect, it's excellent if we have, if we have still bone remain. But uh, in this case, it's, I have to see, I have to be uh, uh, opposing to what uh, uh, our colleagues uh, in the last days who are saying with a, with a um, guided surgery. Not in every case we can use the guided surgery. And in this case, mostly it was almost impossible the use of a guided surgery. Uh, the testimony of, of what I'm saying was the 12 times surgeries she underwent in the last 25 years and she had, as you can see on the screen, she didn't have the results she, was, she expected. And so loosening implants after a very complicated surgery is not very nice, mostly when she did in 12 of her surgeries seven times bone grafting procedures. But uh, we decided uh, to use uh, small implants and to restore that kind of problem with a fixed prosthetic. It sounds very, uh, very, um, very crazy if you say, okay, in an extreme atrophic bone situation, uh, why, how can, you, how can you do a fixed prosthetic? But fixed prosthetic, mostly in this case is uh, the major indication because everything she had before were hybrid prosthetic, removable prosthetic on implants and all these implants were lost. And so there is a reason for, because as higher is the vertical dimension of the prosthetic, as more is the, is the, is the rocking of the, of, the, of the prosthetic and the force, lateral force distribution on the implants. And so it is not <coughs> saying that it is an advantage or better to have a removable prosthetic if we have a patient with an extreme atrophic bone situation. So we decided in this case to get back to the origin and do surgeries with our eyes and looking what we had, which kind of bone and where we could place our implants. The approach was very traumatic. We did a crest of inc an incision, open up a little flap to see where the dimension, how the dimension of the bone are, if they are corresponding to, to our CT scan. And in most of the cases, I have to say, uh, in a traffic case situation like that, we saw that the CT scan is showing quite different scenario than we can see intraorally. And so didn't look as bad as on, uh, on the CT scan. And we found that uh, on the between the mental nerves, we found very good bone and very good, excuse me, this, I have to shut off my phone, and very good uh, bone situation. So the next step was simply to drill with the pilot drill, the first, <coughs> the first osteo osteotomies. 
but as you can see, it was very hard bone, D1, no vascularization, but it is normal if you use high speed spurs on that kind of bone, you will never get vascularization. So what we did, we used the high speed only to, to engage initially our pilot drill to have our, our positioning done and to decide in which position we will place our implants. Afterwards, we were using burrs, which are really atraumatic. Atraumatic burrs cutting only on one edge and cutting only at the tip. If we use this kind of, of burrs, they're cutting also on the tip, but very smoothly, <clears throat> though we can go deeper, slowly, atraumatic, without risking to perforate the cortical of the base of our mandible, which was very thin. So then we had between six and eight millimeters of height, that's it. And so we have to work in that, in that scenario with bursts, with instruments, which allow us to control every second what we are doing and to even to correct our positioning if we see that we are really in a, in a, in a position uh, where we lose our mesodistal bone and buccal oral bone. And so uh, the correction can be done every time, which is very important. And what we can see on uh, this video also is that the osteotomies start to bleed. So we have, we, we activate with this atraumatic bone, with this atraumatic, uh, atraumatic uh, um, osteotomy and atraumatic cut of the burrs, we activate blood vessels, which is very important for the successive healing of the implants. <clears throat> Mostly if we are talking about press fit plateau designed implants like we, we use in this case. So they need blood supply. And generally, implants need blood supply, so it is not, nothing uh, new. It is always an advantage if we have uh, osteotomies with, uh, with uh, uh, enough blood to, to uh, make a better healing after implant placement. So the other aspect you see is from, a traumatic, from this atraumatic uh, uh, drilling and from this, from this uh, uh, osteotomy, we get a lot of autogenous bone, which we will use <coughs> afterwards to cover our implants, which we will see on the next video. But it's important to have this bone, this autogenous bone, and the coverage at crest level, because that gives us uh, a protection of the implants underneath the bone and a new healing of the cortical, which will be uh, the major, the major um, bone which is supporting that kind of implants, which are implants placed slightly under the crest. So after osteotomy, we placed our, our implants. If you see the dimension is a three millimeter diameter, a very a narrow implant, three millimeter and six millimeter lengths, a short implant, narrow, short implant, very tiny implant, which has to support a fixed prosthetic. Implant placement is press fit with the finger. Who don't know this implant system? There is no screw, there is no uh, thread, and so it's not threatened. It's a press fit first with the hand and then uh, with, uh, with the mallet. So that the implant welds, they are exposed, and then the implant will be tapped in.
during the tapping, we can still change the direction of the implant because these implants are really engaged into underneath the crest. And so they have a slight movement before we finally tap them in. The bone, autogenous bone, if you look at how much bone we, we collected from, from a very uh, atrophic bone, then it's a miracle to have all this bone uh, to cover all the defects we produce during the ostomy. It's normal and sometimes we lose some bone buckle wise, but uh, there is nothing to be scared about because we have uh, plenty of autogenous bone to repair that defect. A defect can be uh, closed up, the implants can be covered completely. So we have a so-called protective feeling very important in this kind of, uh, of surgeries where we have really only six to eight millimeter of vertical bone. Beautiful coverage of the bone, of the implants with, uh, with our autogenous bone. And you see the implants almost disappear. What we see here, the black, uh, the black, uh, um, the black uh, cover screws uh, cover uh, abutments. And then we close up suturing. The suture is not uh, that important to see. The important now is after healing, the prosthetic part, because, okay, we have this tiny implants, uh, can we, can we do fixed prosthetic with all kinds of prosthetic? It is not possible because you can imagine it's a very, very extreme case uh, with an extreme situation, with extreme uh, um, cantilevers we have to produce. And so we need, we need uh, as a prosthetic, a material which is very elastic, which is not, uh, which is not rigid and it gives the, the implants uh, the chance to have a biomechanical force distribution which is not as as strong as it would be with a, a, zir a zircone or a metal ceramic uh, prosthetic. That's for sure <laughs> it is important to follow up if we, if we want to resolve extreme cases like that to follow up with special materials uh, metal free uh, fiber reinforced uh, materials which are uh, very important for that kind of uh, long term results. One thing I want uh, to show you was that perforation here at the lower right implant and if you if you look at afterwards after the healing uh, how how well it will be closed and remineralized, then you can understand that atraumatic, um, atraumatic uh, osteotomies, atraumatic uh, uh, drilling is very important. It's very important if you, if you go over certain limits. This is going over certain limits, but we did it for purpose because there were no heights anymore uh, to cover the implants and to put the implant under the, under the crest and so we went, uh, uh, we went uh, through the cortical of the base of the mandible, but with a slow drilling burrs, which are not traumatic. And so they preserved the periosteum and we had a very nice healing, as you will see uh, in the follow-up x-rays. Here we can see it after six months only healing the the upper, uh, the, the lower right, which is the left, extreme left on your screen, uh, got bone around the apex and then remineralization. So the next step was to, to place the abutments. Insert the abutments, which are, <coughs> which are locking tape per uh, connection abutments with a screw on top of the, of the abutments. Uh, when we can uh, screw our um, uh, um, our prosthetic, our fixed prosthetic, over it. <clears throat> uh, 
excuse me, my, my throat is not because of COVID, it's because of uh, too, much, uh, too much wind on the beach because we are here on a big holiday and uh, until Monday, nobody is here at, uh, at, uh, in Rome. And so I got a, a little bit uh, cough here. So um, following the, the prosthetic, we will see that it's an easy procedure. Uh, as everybody knows, screw retained uh, abutments, uh, the same procedures as you know from other, from other kind of, uh, of systems. And uh, the most important, but in this case, it's like I, I told you, is the extension, the distal extension we will have the cantilever distally from uh, the distal implants, which are between 21 and 25 millimeters distal cantilever. Repeating once again, important, it can be done. Yes, we have a lot of uh, studies done uh, on uh, this kind of material. We have a lot of uh, studies done on this kind of, of procedures, uh, atrophic uh, mandibular bone situations, and so uh, we have uh, different uh, articles uh, which uh, shows us after five years follow up that uh, there is no, absolutely no problem with a distal cantilever using this kind of uh, fiber reinforced metal free material. Calculus is the major problem with this implant, uh, with this patients on that implants. But uh, as you can see, there is only calculus. It's not a really uh, pluck. The calculus stays there, but to look at the soft tissue. Soft tissue is very nice, even if we have so much calculus on the, on the abutments. And uh, that's because we have a locking taper underneath the soft tissue and uh, uh, bacterial seal between the implant and the abutment. And that is helping, you, uh, helping us a lot uh, not to have uh, uh, major infections. So it's only cleaning up uh, the calculus from the abutments before we seat and insert the final, the final prosthetic. As you see, the whole procedure is it's easy. It is very easy to, to, to manage because we have really nothing to do with the implants underneath. It's only, only screwing over this uh, uh, detachable abutments, our prosthetic. And squeezing very well, the, the uh, tightening very well the, uh, the screws. The upper prosthetic is a, is, a, is a removable prosthetic. Yes, it's a removable prosthetic. It's for sure, in, in this case, it's, uh, some many, many uh, um, clinicians ask me, seeing uh, this case, so we are showing with uh, opposing tools. Oh, okay, but what would it be if it would be a, a, another kind of prosthetic? Uh, for sure, it's that uh, this kind of, of extreme atrophic bone situation, we will find always uh, that uh, they're identical patients. And so uh, that, that's very rare that we find uh, an upper uh, case, an, an upper um, opposing denture, which is a fixed prosthetic with a metal ceramic. But even though we have some, a couple of these cases, uh, we didn't have that problems. And so I think uh, it, it's not that big difference. But what it makes uh, very important uh, for these patients in that age mostly is that once they have uh, a fixed prosthetic and the mandible, which is uh, doable to do, much easier and much more predictable than in the upper, then the lower, if the lower is fixed, the upper prosthetic, removable prosthetic will be, will be tighter, will, be, will have a, a much better suction on the, on the palatal. This is what the, uh, the patients always refer to us. We are starting always first with the mandible and then maybe we do the, the, the upper also if it's possible 
if the patient has bone and don't, don't, the problem is if the patient don't want to do bone grafting procedures in the lower, it's, it's predictable to do it in the upper, sometimes it's not. We have to do uh, sinus lift elevations, bone splittings and, and all this uh, kind of, of uh, surgeries, which, uh, which leads to, to a result of a, of a fixed prosthetic. But sometimes it's not possible, like uh, in, in this patient's case, also she didn't want to continue uh, a procedure on the upper because she was very happy with what she had actually. So that was uh, after control, we will skip that video. Here we can see inside the calculus formation, but the calculus formation is not hurting much the abutments as, as we can see. Important is, yes, there is some pluck. Uh, this was after one year uh, of, uh, of um, a follow-up after one year. She didn't clean very well. Now she's doing it much better. But even though, if you look at the soft tissue, the soft tissue is ex explaining as if there is uh, a mucositis, uh, a problem with the soft tissue or not, it's not because it's very healthy. So the plaque is relatively uh, irrelevant in this case. After two years follow up, we can really see that uh, the bone, the bone is very well mineralized around this very tiny small implants. And even if we have this big extension, uh, the implants are not suffering. Uh, the, the, it would be much, more different if I can tell you if uh, <clears throat> the patient, as you can see in the upper, she has remained one of the O-ring uh, implants of the old O-ring implants they, they placed on her and they, they stood there seven months, seven months. After seven months, she lost four implants and one remained there. And so it is not predictable at all if uh, we are talking uh, about a trophic bone situation to do removable. Most of the cases for us, for our group, I repeat to you, it's not, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, restricted to what, what we are doing with, with this kind of implants, with a, a plateau uh, design implant. And um, with that kind of implants, it's a different situation, a different scenario. And we had very well, very, uh, very good results uh, with atrophic bone situations. Some of the, the, the articles we, we published in the, in the last five years uh, showing us that uh, results are always positive. We have uh, really sometimes more than 96% uh, success rate. And the prosthetics uh, following um, Professor Rolf Evers' studies, recent studies, uh, were almost uh, no repair in five years and so uh, it's a it's a good sign for most of the population of the elderly population even if they have to suffer now with the covid but uh, let's uh, hope that uh, they don't have to suffer with dent uh, with uh, with the dentistry with the uh, with their tooth so if you can give them that chance to 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 have a better stable talk You don't understand what she's saying, but no. Uh, but the important is uh, to see on the, on the um, magnification screen that the prosthetic, the upper prosthetic is, is not moving at all. It's not moving at all. And it's a, a, a removable prosthetic. And she had before always this problem. She came mostly because of that problem. She wants to fix the upper first. And I told her, let's fix the fir first, the, the lower, and let's do a fix prosthetic on the lower and now she is very happy with that with that situation and here she's talking about the history of, of her of her of her uh, implantology uh, experiences uh, with the 12 surgeries and so on and uh, that she's finally after this is after two years of uh, of uh, uh, follow-up uh, uh, she's having uh, she's very happy and uh, this is important that we have to make our patients very happy
So now, <coughs> very, very short and fast, I think I have, uh, I don't know, I have 10 or 15 minutes to go. Um, another scenario, which is the upper, the upper um, atrophic bone situations, which are <coughs> also critical, maybe sometimes more critical than, than uh, the lower. So I, I hope uh, you can see a yes, second. Sir. Yes, okay. So what happened with the upper? In the upper, <clears throat> we have very often cases where we, we don't know, we don't know if to do bone grafting procedures or splitting, or if it's, is it possible even to avoid bone, bone uh, <clears throat> splitting or bone grafting procedures. It depends on, depends on which materials we are using, once again, and uh, which skills we have. But very often, it, is it necessary to do bone grafting procedures in certain cases uh, where we have a very thin, thin uh, crest situation, uh, like in the upper anterior, a static area. Let's, uh, let's think about uh, the uh, agenesis, um, the... Uh, congenitally missing teeth, uh, where we have uh, more and more cases. I think I did uh, last year, we did more than between 50 and 70 cases in, in the different, different uh, facilities. And there are always more and more. And uh, how to arrange them, how to, uh, to treat them. It's, uh, very often it's not easy because uh, for one tooth to do a bone grafting procedure, it's, uh, it's not very predictable to also because there is no space between the two roots and uh, we will see it now in uh, different, in, uh, different graphics. <clears throat> but the literature, what does the literature say? <coughs> the literature is saying that if you want to place narrow implants on the upper anterior, we should have five millimeter distance between the neighbor tooth and the neighbor roots, excuse me and at least four millimeter buckle palatal wise. So, because we have to respect and the concept of the pressure necrosis. So what is the, the, the concept of pressure necrosis? Everybody knows that, but I want to repeat it very fast. It's simply, if you go close to, to a cortical with a threaded implants and you press against the cortical, there will be, not every time, but there can be a good percentage the phenomena of necrosis of the bone. So mostly if you place in the upper anterior aesthetic area an implant and screw it in uh, where the buccal bone is very thin and we achieve only a necrosis and then the buccal bone, bone will disappear. So that's a problem. Uh, we had in the past and we still have, but okay, there are new uh, surgical procedures like uh, expansions, uh, bone splittings with uh, new materials, with new in instruments, which gives us a better control of that problem. But even though, let's suppose you have four millimeter of bone and you know, 3.5 to four, and you want to place your threaded implants, uh, then you are in a limit, okay? You are still in a limit, and how can we avoid it? Generally, with a threaded implant, it's, it's nothing to avoid. We have to simply, uh, if you have this two situation, <coughs> get to an, uh, a surgery, which is uh, the bone grafting procedure or a splitting procedure. In the first, and on, on the left side, on your left side, you see the very thin bone. Uh, situation is uh, 2.3, 1.9 in the, in the apex and so at, at the beginning of the crest and so there is, in that case, uh, most of the surgeons and plantologists decide to do um, a bone grafting procedure. Which bone grafting procedure is the best? I'm not saying that, but uh, these are 
is coming from, from uh, the oral surgery and maxillofacial uh, community. It's for sure as the uh, Curie technique, the Curie box technique is absolutely the best, uh, with the best results we can achieve with this, uh, with a double layer uh, placement of uh, a, a, a cortical bone coming from the ramus and filled with the autogenous bone. And so we have then in this case, very, very good results and a very nice uh, uh, reforming of bone, but it is very difficult to make. <clears throat> it's a very difficult procedure. Fuat Kuri is the best in uh, this procedure for sure. He is great in that, beautiful results. And then I see in different universities where they tried to do, uh, to repeat the Curie technique was not so successful. And so it depends on the skill uh, of the single um, operator. And so that becomes, becomes then once again, a restricted uh, therapy for only a few people. And on the other hand, <coughs> Also with sandwich techniques, simple sandwich techniques and not curry techniques, uh, you, need, you need a volume of bone. And so and then on the left side, you can see it's too tiny and there is nothing to do. You can't do a bone grafting procedure on a very tiny bone like that because the bone chip you place, place on it, on, buckle, on the buckle area would be so thin that it would resorb easily. So we need also a volume to do certain bone grafting procedures. <coughs> and here we see on the left and on the right the difference between what we can achieve without bone grafting procedures, which is using narrow implants, pressing them in between the corticals. I will show you then with a, with a case how to press and how to achieve that that result and having then a very nice result clinic wise uh, you will see it also on on the case at the case because uh, the most important is uh, what is the aesthetic then because most uh, of the clinicians uh, claim that uh, that very thin bone and that defect at the buckle uh, is aesthetically not uh, advisable to 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 uh, maintain, so we, we should fill it. Yeah. You can fill it uh, afterwards. There are other techniques to fill it aesthetically, but the most important is, is it, is it a, a predictable procedure for the, for the patient and for the operator? Yeah. The most important is that. Uh, everybody can do that on the left side. I say yes. Could, uh, once you learn it, you know, very, uh, it's very predictable. Can, can everybody do that on the right side? No, I'm, personally, I'm not doing the, the Curie box technique. I tried it and uh, I don't do it anymore because it's also very traumatic for the patient. And then my patients are coming and they're blaming on me or this is the, the major problem in, in uh, implant industry. So being minimal, minimally invasive. So the, once again, the press fit implant is, is the ideal implant for this kind of, of, of treatment of, of this uh, kind of, of procedures because press fit implants, even if they are attached to the, uh, to the um, cortical, uh, they, don't, they don't produce the phenomena of the pressure necrosis. There is no pressure on the uh, on the walls, on the osteotomy walls. There is only a, a retention at the very end of the, <coughs> of the plateaus, like we can see in the lower, in the lower histology. And the plateaus, which are, uh, which are empty spaces, practically, the so-called so uh, healing chambers, these healing chambers, they are passivated. They are not pressing any bone. It's only the edges of the plateaus are pressing on the bone. So that, that uh, pressure, that pressure necrosis is not the case in press fits plateau design implants. So we can work quite in a different way and think in a different way, even if we have only three millimeter of bone or 2.5 millimeter of bone width, we could think of 
to press the bone away, the two corticals away, to do a splitting, insert it without, without bone grafting that area necessarily. <coughs> the same as and major problem would, would be if the roots are very close to, together, which happens very often in, uh, after orthodontic treatments, there are spaces which can't be filled with an implant because uh, the space between the two roots is to only two millimeters, 2.5 millimeters or three millimeters. And that's, that's a bigger problem. And in that case, <coughs> we can use our different procedures. I will be very fast now because I see I'm running out of time and uh, it's important to show very fast the cases. Three by eight millimeter narrow implants are placed here. The osteotomy is done very simply with an expansion with a so-called hand trimmers. These are reamers which are cutting the bone, but if you work around 360 degrees or 280 or 45 degrees, you can cut the bone, but you can also press and decompress and expand the bone with that hand trimmers without overexpanding because uh, the hand reamers are not 360 degrees round, but only 270 because on the on one side is the cutting edge. And so it's an empty space, which is not pressing against the palatal bone. And so we can press only the buccal bone towards the buccal and having a really nice expansion, two to three millimeters of expansion. Same situation with it on the other side pressing both into the bone and doing an expansion, which leads us to place the implants inside the cancellous bone. But also, as you see, they are laying very softly on the buccal bone and on the palatal crest, a cortical, excuse me, buccal and palatal cortical. So it is, without pressing that in the, the, the two bone situation, the, the, the two bone uh, anatomies. So what is important in, uh, in, all this, uh, in all this discussion is once again, the prosthetic. Uh, you have to go over if you use a very narrow uh, implant, if you use it in a place where the bone has to be, has to be mineralized and stimulated, that you have to go over uh, with a temporization, a first temporization, the first two, three months. So the uh, implants uh, get uh, the bone around the implants get mineralized, stimulated. <clears throat> and meanwhile, also the soft tissue can heal much better, though we have a precise idea, aesthetic wise, what we have to do with the final prosthetic, which is very important. So here we see very nice healing of the soft tissue around, around the, the tempor temporary um, abutments and the temporary crown, excuse me. <coughs> and then six weeks after the impression taking, the correction of the crowns, the insertion and a five years control of this case. Five years control showing you nice mineralization around the plateaus, uh, the stable cortical at crest level, which makes this implant very particular and unique. Oh, the last, the last point was that case with a interproximal root situation, which is very, very critical. We have only after eight millimeters of of depth, we have only two point something millimeters between the two roots. At crest level, we have barely 3.5. And uh, so a regular implant placement uh, is generally not possible, but it can be done, like in this case, with a particular te technique, which I call interproximal root spreading, spreading, excuse me, interproximal root spreading. And so we push the implants in between the two roots and in between the periodontal ligament very slowly 
it's a procedure which needs time that means every every uh, burr you see which is placed here has to stay there between five and ten minutes okay let it let it stay let it let the periodontal ligament understand that it has to move that's it <clears throat> So once again, the end dreamers, very useful for that kind of, of procedure because uh, they are cutting only on one side and the cutting edge is sliding always towards the palatal bone, which is the stronger bone, which we don't want to expand. And so the only side we don't want to expand will not be expanded with these hand dreamers, but mesodistally and buccal wise, we have an expansion. In this case, mostly between the two roots, we engage tapping, tapping very carefully the hand dreamers in between the two roots and finding our space without, without cutting off the periodontal ligament. Here we don't cut the periodontal ligament with no burr, with no threat. And so what we do is we press away the periodontal ligament of the neighbor tooth. It's nothing new, like you, not, nothing new, like you will see from an old study from 1980. <clears throat> Implant is placed, and here we see how it's laying in between the two roots. It's a three millimeter diameter implant, eight millimeter long. And the procedure is simply push slowly the two roots away from each other, okay? But I'm talking about millimeters, uh, no, point millimeters, excuse me. From 2.5, you go to three, okay? To 3.2, 3.3, that's not less than one millimeter uh, between the two surfaces uh, to press it all out away, no? That's nothing, nothing particular. The patient don't feel anything after, after surgery, the same thing. There is no pressure on the tooth, nothing special what they can feel. <clears throat> after six months healing, same procedure, first the temporization and then the final crown. So what I was saying, the last thing is 1980. Once again, the great professor Rolf Evers from Vienna, he showed that thing. He said osteogenesis screws, which are not self-taping, they were self-taping, and so not as as uh, traumatic as a, as a, um, an implant, a screwed implant, a threaded implant, excuse me. <laughs> and what he showed is that with the pressure, with that pressure against the per uh, periodontal, with a smooth pressure against the periodontal ligament, the periodontal ligament changes its direction. And here's the histology <coughs> of the duct tooth. The histology, you can see the movement of the periodontal ligament, which moves and changes the direction, okay? Without, without having problems of necrosis of the, of the natural tooth. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks to listen to, to me, excuse me for my voice. I can't change it, unfortunately, <clears throat> it's what it is. And uh, I'm here to, to listen to your questions. First question itself is a very interesting question. What is the failure rate of short implants? And what do you do if one short implant fails? Do you, is there a possibility that we can restore a sh short implant? Uh, the first, uh, the first uh, question was, uh, what is the? Failure rate of short implants. Excuse me, I don't understand the, the word. All right. I... One second. Yeah, it yeah. says, what is the failure rate of short ah, implants? The failure rate, excuse me, failure rate. Failure rate. Yes, okay. sir. The failure rate is 100%. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, the failure rate of short implants generally, of short implants, there are so many, there are so many articles now uh, 
in uh, in PubMed, you can you can look at it. Uh, so the fa failure rate is, is as the same as the failure rate of standard implants. There is no difference anymore. So there is really an uh, an uh, evolution of uh, of the of the short implants market. And not every short implant is working. That's for sure. <clears throat> But some of the uh, impl uh, short implants on the market are very good. Mostly the, the, the implants, the short implants, which are, which are guaranteed by the, by the big uh, companies for sure. And uh, the companies who have uh, uh, good experience with it. That's very important to see because now, they, uh, now on the market there are thousands of short implants. I tell you, uh, eight years ago, there were only four, four systems on the market with short implant. And only two or four <coughs> were claiming that uh, the implant, the short implants will sustain a single crown. And so it's a very new market, okay? The uh, short implant market, except for sure our, our implant, uh, which is Bicon exists for 35 years and so, uh, we had short implants uh, from the beginning and now we have 35 years of experience with that implant. And our failure rates are uh, the same as the standards. Sometimes we have a little bit more in some, in some facilities like uh, uh, the universities because uh, we are working there uh, with extreme cases. Extreme cases, we are trying extreme solutions like you saw in the first case and uh, then it drops down to 93 94 percent but it's 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 that okay so you don't have to be scared about uh, the short implants but uh, please uh, take care of uh, which one you use uh, so much so. in case of in case of failure if you can replace it it's the the easiest the best thing in uh, in the world is that if you use exclusively short implants like I'm doing. Uh, if I have a failure, for me, it's a, it's a piece of cake because what is it? It's a five millimeter short implant to remove and not a 50 millimeters long implant, okay? It's a quite different story <clears throat> because a failure is, can be happen, can happen uh, for the short, for the long implant, for the standard implant. But if you have an 18 millimeter long implant for, of an, uh, for example, all on four, which breaks, and then take out this long implant. And what you are doing then, I don't know. Uh, it's very difficult then to, 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 to uh, re-implant in the same situation in the same moment. Uh, with the short implants, you take a bigger diameter and that's it. And you, place it, you replace it once again with a uh, bigger, wider diam diameter of implant. Thank you, sir. We move to the next question. <clears throat> Can we use short implant for any and every case? Yes, this is what I was telling you. Short implant uh, for any and, uh, and every case. I'm, I'm talking always about uh, the one I'm using, okay? Uh, I can guarantee you that uh, it is not a problem. We are using it in every kind of case. We have, uh, like you saw, six millimeters, only six millimeters to, to place. Okay, we place the ultra short. We have 15, 20 millimeters, we, we place a short implant. Why we have to drill necessarily 15, 18 millimeter deep? It's all, always a trauma. It's more I'm drilling in the patient's bone, as more is a trauma. And so why I have to traumatize the bone of a patient? And keep, keep shorter in every case. Thank you so much, sir. We move to the next question. A country like India is a very price sensitive market. How do we convince our patients to use such expensive implant systems? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a question of marketing. Uh, 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 that's for sure. It is, it is difficult to, to, to convince, but uh, what can you do to convince a patient if he wants or she wants uh, uh, prosthetic fixed prosthetic like I show you in, uh, showed you in the first case there is no uh, convincing is very simple uh, or you do bone grafting procedures which costs you three times more okay or you use this kind of implant and the trauma is less and uh, okay the time is less this is uh, very important also to to understand uh, it is not only the price of the implant which makes the difference it's uh, the treatment the, the solution which gives you an implant. 
which is the big difference. And then the price is relatively low because uh, if you have to do a bone graft, you need bone grafting material. If you don't, you don't, uh, it's, it's less expensive. And so you take a cheap implant and then uh, you have to use uh, membranes and bone grafting materials, which has to be good. And they are expensive, the good ones. The cheap ones are not good. This is in, in, in bone grafting materials are very, very sensitive. And so this is what happened. If you want to do a good surgery, if you want to be a good dentist, a good implantologist, you have to use good materials. And the re solutions give you the option that uh, even if the price is high, uh, the therapy costs less than another one. Thank you so much, sir. We move to the next question. What kind of surface treatment is done on a short implant? Surface treatment is uh, acid edged and, 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 and then it's, um, it's, uh, it's covered by tricalcium phosphate. It's a calcium phosphate surface, which is, which is uh, the coverage of the implant. And so it gives the implant a better, um, let's see, solution in the, in the first months of healing. Okay, the calcium phosphate uh, treatment. This is what is uh, it's the goal is of, of this uh, calcium phosphate treatment. But I tell you, it, it is relatively the same if you wait six months, if it's, if it's uh, a coded or an uncoded implant. In that case, it depends on uh, what time you, you want to reopen an implant. So the uncovered, if you wait, even if you wait six months, it's the same thing as having an, a covered implant with, uh, with a CP code, okay? But the CP code, it is good if you want to accelerate the process, process of healing because you have to reopen after two months or three months, okay? Thank you so much, sir. We move to the next question. If we place a short implant mm -hmm. and if there is any alveolar bone residue remaining after the placement of the dental implant, what problem can the patient face? Can you repeat the question? Because I didn't get the, the point. Sure, sir. If we place a short implant, and if there is any alveolar bone residue remaining after the placement of the dental implant, what problems will the patient face? Alveolar bone residue? Uh, my, um, no, I really, <laughs> it's difficult to understand that question. Um, I suppose that uh, the, the clinician who asked that means um, if, uh, if we have um, some procedure of alveolar bone inside the osteotomy or, or something like that. And I really don't understand the question. What uh, I would the goal request, of the question is. Sure, sir. I would, is that, is that, the, yeah. Yeah, I would request the person who's asked the question. Sir, I request you to kindly reframe your question so that we understand yes. it in a better way. We move to the next question. Okay, thank you. Is there any micro movement after placing a short implant while tapping or after surgery? Micro movement of the implant. Micro movements are in all implants because we are working cancerous bone, except if you have a D1 bone. Micro movement, is, it's, it's normal, I would say. No? But uh, um, it's not relevant for the, for the healing because it depends on if it's a D1, D2, D3, or D4 bone. That is, uh, that's very, very important. Uh, the micro movements, for example, uh, are important uh, if you do immediate loading. In immediate loading, uh, an excess of micro movement uh, would lead uh, to a non-healing of, uh, of the implant. That's for sure. But this is the reason why we are using that. We block the implants with a prosthetic. And, so, and once you block the implant with a prosthetic, the micro movement is reduced. Okay, that's very important to understand. Uh, if you have uh, a D4, a movement, or for example, an immediate placement of an implant, independent of it, if it's a screw retainer or, or Vicon. An immediate placement of an implant very often happen that uh, in that case, the implant slightly moves. We saw it also with our internal or crestal sinus elevation implant placed completely in the, in the, in the, in the uh, bone grafting material. 
uh, during the healing, it's normal that the implant moves because the patient moves. Yeah? It's not a micro movement in that case. It's mostly uh, a normal movement. And what happens is that the positioning, the initial prosthetic positioning can change. In that case, after three months, you find the implant is more distal than you placed it or more mesial. This is the reason why generally we use, we use then abutments to, to uh, fix that position in in place that's very important thank you so much dr mauro last question i would like to know what is the long term prognosis of short implants with sinus lift long term prog prognosis you mean a long term prognosis long term prognosis uh, with sinus lift is, is as well as uh, the other implants if not better we have a study now uh, which will be published uh, recently from the University of Verona, the five-year follow-up, five-year follow-up of uh, of crestal sinus lift elevations of uh, 136 implants, and the result is it's almost the same as uh, a standard implant placement. So there is no difference at all, and uh, you have to think of um, that with uh, with a plateau design implants the internal or crestal sinus lift elevation has a, an advantage which is the extreme good blood supply insides and underneath the schneiderian membrane because schneiderian membrane is bleeding a lot and so giving a lot of blood supply which is the major food for the healing of a plateau designed implant because I told you, I saw you, the ch healing chambers are very important. Inside the healing chambers should be uh, blood clots. And from blood, blood clot, as you know, you have osteoid bone and so on. And then mineralization is after, uh, with, our, uh, with our crown, after uh, loading for sure. 